Hello and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jack Yates. I am the communications officer here at the Royal Armouries. I say here, um, we are obviously currently not at the Royal Armouries, um, but yeah, welcome very much to this uh, live webinar. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a lot to get through tonight. So uh, I'm gonna rush through a, little, a few items of housekeeping. I'm gonna introduce everybody and then we can um, jump into the bulk of what we're gonna be talking about. So uh, a few things just to mention first, um, please feel free to fire any questions at us as the webinar progresses. There will be an opportunity to ask any of our panelists questions at the end. Um, and there should be sort of 15 to 20 minutes to do that. Um, but fire them in and if we can get them in as we're going, then um, I will definitely put them across. Um, just to say that the Royal Armouries is a charity and like all charities and museums at the moment, we've been hit quite hard by COVID. We've lost a lot of our revenue streams. So if you do feel compelled to donate to us, that would be must, must, much appreciated at the moment. Um, and we also have a membership scheme, uh, which entitles people to lots of extra content, lots of exclusive offers and that sort of thing. Uh, there are links to both of those things um, in the chat here and on YouTube. So uh, yeah, please give generously, that's much appreciated. Um, is there anything else I need to mention? I don't think so, which means that we can jump in and start introducing who I have here on the call with me. So firstly, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Assistant Creator of Armour, Keith Bowen. Hi, Keith. Um, Hi. <laughs> Keith joined the Royal Armouries in 2014 um, after having worked with Toby Capwell at the Wallace Collection. He has an MA in Medieval and Renaissance Studies um, from University College London, and he's currently working on a major project, project into the development of armour during the life of Edward the Black Prince. So great to have you uh, alongside me, Keith. Uh, Keith's going to be giving us a lot of the uh, historical perspective tonight. Um, I'm also obviously joined by uh, three people who don't particularly need too much um, introduction, I imagine, because Tonight's webinar has been our record attended webinar. Um, and we are, I hope there's enough internet space because we have lots of people signed up. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna hand over to um, these chaps to almost introduce themselves, um, starting with David Marshall. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen um, and hopefully you guys can all see um, some of the work that these uh, guys have done. So David, over to you. Okay. Well Thanks, Jack. I'm David. I'm um, TM Terrain and uh, MM Dioramas. So I was heavily involved in the Diorama at Agincourt as project manager and general model builder. I've been a professional model maker for about 20 years and a war gamer all my life. So when we set up the TM Terrain, I, we went for bespoke uh, war gaming and um, model making uh, Jobs. So what I've decided to do today in my introduction, just go through a series of photographs of my work. And I just thought I'd explain a few things um, about them. So the, these first group of photographs, the similarity with these and the Agincourt diorama is that all the figures are, are I've, I've fixed in place. So you can see that um, they're, they're, they're related, they've, they've got terrain, and the figures all in place. And I love doing this sort of thing because you can start to tell the story. Uh, you can play, place figures so they're looking at each other, they're shooting each other, they're, you know, they're getting out that landing craft. They, you can see that they're trying to take the, um, the pillbox. The Lancer there with being shot at as, uh, by the Highlanders as you know, trying to take the square. You're know, hugging down behind that tank, and the, the exciting thing with that was trying to get the angle of the tank to make that an exciting dynamic diorama. So, but I also do other work for um, museums, and I, I have a nice relationship with a guy in, in the states, and he he has he works with small town museums that like to do dioramas for their uh, for their history. So this is a an American revolutionary uh, diorama. I did the building and he's done the diorama. That lovely shape, that was a good idea of his. So. But, um, and then this next lot are just pictures of, of what I do. That's a 1 30th scale uh, tank factory. 1 30th scale, so that means the figures are about 60, 60, 60 centimeters, 60 millimeters tall. Uh, and that's one of my most popular uh, scales that I work in. Uh, that tank is a um, again one thirtieth. This was a diorama for 
Is that the death of Davo? Don't know, but it's well, um, not Lanes, is it? Lanes, that's the guy. Yes, Alan. <laughs> so uh, that's a uh, little round top that I did for War Games Illustrated for their their photo shoot and uh, um, their real rocks. Quite a heavy diorama that was. Um, so, but and then this 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 is a, a, a farmhouse at Gettysburg called. Uh, can't remember but um that uh, i supplied the house and he did the the, the client did the, the rest of it running water I, I i'm asked to do all sorts of things this is a fa that was a fantasy layout but i also do um stuff based on his historical things and look at that that looks um the chap there was um he's very much into photography of his collection so I supplied the buildings and he did the rest. And it makes a big difference having the background there. A very much a war gamey piece. Uh, totally made up. Round table, Alamo, anything. So it's historical made up. That's a, a fictitious landscape, but based around Berlin. Um, that's a 28 millimeter uh, piece. I did the buildings in the background. They, they're all, all those bricks are hand carved. Takes ages. <laughs> Similar sort of thing. Um, that's uh, an American Civil War. Uh, uh, and that fort in the background, that is all hand carved bricks as well. A lot of my work seems to be just sitting there, just repetitive work. Um, the, these next three are based on Saving Private Ryan, the last scene in the in the in the film, where they finally they're, they're trying to save the bridge. So that was uh, the sniper position. It's all condensed because that's only a four by two table. So, you, but you'll recognise the buildings and things like that from. And again, it's the photography that does a lot of this. Same. Um, A Saladin Saracen Type Four. Ignore ignore the timber framing on the top, but that's what he wanted. A Russian. Um, uh, again, all all one thirtieth scale stuff. Hand hand carved bricks, individual tiles on the roof, and this is what I do all day for the last twenty years. I just I just potter in my room. Now this one, go just just for, for people of a certain age. Recognise that as the airfix strong point. It yep. was, I, I thoroughly enjoyed doing that. That's a 130th scale piece. It was great because <clears throat> that was the only building available, wasn't it, 20 years, 40 years ago? Indeed. So <laughs> I, I, that was great fun making that. So that's what I do all day. So there you go. I think I've just realised I had that house as well. So it I transcends. Bet you did. Everybody did. <laughs> Everybody did. <laughs> so if I am now able to uh, hand over to, to Michael and Alan, um, I think Michael, if, if you go first. Hello. Uh, yes, we're part of, um, per obviously, me and Alan are Perry Miniatures, and uh, we've been um, doing, making figures since about 19, I don't know, I think since we're about six years old. But professionally since um, about 1979 uh, for Games Workshop. And then obviously a lot of, uh, mainly his historical that we, we prefer. So uh, the Games Workshop stuff, it was a full-time job, but um, this is what really get us going is uh, anything historical. And uh, this is all these figures, all these ranges, I think, I think we're going to run out of photographs in a minute, are all from a uh, range that I made for um, uh, Perry Miniatures over the last few years, since about 1980. So, no, when, when did we start? No, 2001. 2001. God, <laughs> it's flying by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the Crusades range, the others were uh, mainly colonial ranges. Um, uh, Sudan. Oh, and also I've done a number of uh, um, illustrations for, or books for Osprey, I think about. Probably half a dozen. Uh, this it's just something different again. This is my latest range. I'm just doing the artwork for the back of the boxes for the plastic um, Franco-Prussian War. This is something completely different again. This is <laughs> this is Smaug 
that I made uh, digitally, the only model I ever made digitally for um, Gangs Workshop. I'm going to work there. And that's it, really. That's all I've done. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, uh, this is Alan Perry here. Um, so from now on, you just see the, the ranges I've made, which heavily Nape Napoleonic or 18th century uh, AWI here. Um, it's just such a colourful period. Uh, both all colourful periods that uh, you just can't resist. So many uniforms, like almost like world wars, but in fancy dress. Uh, and I love taking photographs. We both love taking photographs of um, miniatures and uh, terrain. We also make a lot of ter terrain as well and buildings. Um, not these ones, though. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, these are, these are part. Th these are part of the Asian Corps. I made the Asian Corps range about twelve years ago. And uh, these are pictures of close-ups of the, the range, really. Uh, but these are the ones you'll see on, on the actual diorama. These are the figures that are used on the diorama. I also illustrate as well, but mostly for in-house stuff. And we do a lot of wargaming. Uh, quite a few of us gather for wargames quite regularly, when we could. And hopefully we will <laughs> soon. Uh, right, th well, this. Um, Peter Jackson uh, contacted us uh, in 2015 and uh, e emailed asking if we would like to help out on building the diorama of Chanuk Bear. So we said yes. This was in, on December the 10th, he emailed. This was right in the middle of the Ashen Corps diorama being built. And uh, we said, oh yeah, that sounds great. Uh, how many figures? And he said, well, about three and a half thousand. It actually increased to five thousand in the end. And we said, "When would you?" He said, "We said, when would you need it for?" He said, "Oh, April." So that gave us four, five, four months uh, to build would... a, what ended up being a five thousand figure diorama in New Zealand. Uh, obviously, we didn't do the terrain. We helped no. do the terrain <laughs> no. over there, but we just organised getting the figures made, figures had them cast, sent over to New Zealand. Uh, this is us in Hobbiton, in Bag End. Bag End, actually, yeah. There are a few yeah. perks, obviously, knowing Peter. He has quite a few toys. Uh, oh, that's me in the background, look. <laughs> Big arrow. Uh, we, you, yeah, we got to dress up and uh, appear in the film, as people probably know. Some people will know, because <laughs> we can't stop talking about it. Um, and that's me in the front of the aircraft, the fe 2 b Both of us went up in the... As Peter's aircraft uh, collection. Uh, it just happened that the camera aircraft was um, flying as I was up in this one. So I'm on the gun for that. He, he has his own factory building, first of all, aircraft. And uh, he normally make, makes about two or three of each type. And uh, mainly because it's che as cheap to do that as uh, make one. Well, I hope now everyone is sufficiently jealous of uh, Alan and Michael's relationship with Peter Jackson, and we all wish that we had the same. Um, so I think this brings us perfectly on to um, Agincourt Diorama itself. Um, and what you will all be able to see in front of you is an artist's impression, uh, that artist being uh, Alan himself, um, of what the Agincourt Diorama initially m may have looked like. Um, and um, Keith, would you just be able to outline for us um, a little bit about the, the historical factors, um, sorry, the, 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 scale, the, the scale of the Battle of Agincourt um, is often disputed. Um, so would you just be able to give us a bit of an outline about um, how we came to decide on the scale of our diorama? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, back in 2015, the Royal Armouries um, commissioned Michael, Alan and David to produce a model of uh, the Battle of Agincourt for our 500th anniversary commemorations and uh, to begin with if I understand rightly Alan it was sort of going to be a an almost one-to-one -one scale um, no not quite well well it was oh, is 10,000 10, figures, 10, uh, figures originally envisaged so I thought I'll go away and try and do a um, mock-up of what that might look like and uh, and at, at the time I think they're talking about a 21 foot by 11 foot table something like a that, mon yeah. monster but so i did this so just all the photoshop I photographed a few units of figures photoshopped and photoshopped again and 
produce this. It looks a little bit um, uh, like Spain, <laughs> the background, but it's, a, it's a bit too um, sandy. But right. uh, it's just to give the general impression to show Tram Court to Agincourt on the, as a, both flanks, even the manor house and the part of the camp, which we hope to get in in the original um, diorama. Uh, but after a few meetings, this was reduced a bit, basically because of the size of the uh, room they had in the uh, tower, London, wouldn't uh, this wouldn't fit in. So it had to come down to a 12 by six, so you could get people around it as well. But in a way that was, that almost uh, worked to our advantage really, because there are so many unknowns about the battle, the, uh, the nature of the battle, Indeed. differing views the number of yeah. uh, combatants yeah. there, how many English versus how many French. And even now there have been challenges to the traditional site. So if you had included um, the model of the castle at Agincourt, then maybe archeology span in the future would say, oh, actually uh, the battle took place on the other side. And then there would have been yeah. a bit of an issue, but actually now that that isn't part of the, um, the model, uh, we could almost, it doesn't really matter if the location of the battlefield changes, your model will still stand as a good representation of what we think um, the Battle of Agincourt was like based on the latest research. Yeah, it, yes. Although initially, initially when we went for the first meeting, um, we, I think we all thought that, that, that there was going to be, um, the French were at completely outnumbered the English force, 5,000 odd English and up to 50,000 French, as contemporary sources some say. And uh, looking at Anne Curry's book, it came down to, I think it was about 9,000 French and yeah, five or 6,000 English, so far more. It was about three um, to two, wasn't it? The, the ratio yeah, kept. three to two, yeah, which was uh, so Jack. surprised oh. Wes, who was in charge <laughs> at the time. I, I was gonna say, if you go back a little bit, just to, um, uh, yeah, we one I, one thing I, I was thinking of is we, we needed to speed up painting and also we're a bit worried about the amount of weight in on each board. So uh, I think as I woke up in the morning thinking, oh, well done, how about making little blocks, resin blocks or figures? So I, I glued about 40 figures together uh, and had them resined. And I think this is about 37 blocks here. Uh, in the end, we didn't use them all. I mean, uh, I've got, there you go. <laughs> you can see them in the next shot. But um, that's what they ended up like. But the idea was to reduce, reduce the weight and time painting, which I think it actually did in the end. I think it did It help. did, dramatically, yes, it did, yeah. Uh, obviously, <laughs> the idea was to fill in all the gaps with individual figures, but just to bulk out the, the main French forces because they're driven in by the arrows, uh, sort of, into a clumps. I mean, I think a lot of people think of uh, the Battle of Agincourt as being this, uh, as the French primarily being on horseback. Certainly, if you look at the 1944 film, <laughs> you would get that impression. But actually, in reality, the, the bulk of French were, were on foot, weren't they? Yeah. 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 There's they're, they're thousand, <laughs> yeah. I believe there's 1,500 on one side and 800 on the other, uh, for yeah. the uh, average on the flanks. And, uh, yeah. They didn't do, do too well, did they? <laughs> would it be fair to say that this sort of time-saving initiative that, that Alan came up with, where the troops are quite tightly packed, would it be fair to say that the French at the Battle of Agincourt were sort of similar, similarly packed in? Yeah. By all yeah, I, th yeah. I, I, th I think there's accounts saying that they were hemmed, uh, they just forced themselves together into a, almost like a, a V shape. Just uh, a and I, think as, I think as well, the, if we'd have placed individual figures, we wouldn't have got them so tightly packed. It wouldn't have given that impression of no. real shoulder. You, know, you can only get individual figures so close together, can't you? But those mm. resin blocks really were gave. Yeah, they were around the tents. Yeah. Um, and French, the heads would be down. Heads would be down as well, offering the yeah. least resistance to the arrows coming in. So um, yeah, fairly horrendous. A, a question for you, David. In in terms yeah. of the battlefield location. Um, and I guess all of those conversations going on around um, where, where it happened, numbers, all that kind of thing. What, what does that do to, to your plans when you're thinking about putting together a diorama? What, what's going through your mind as those conversations are going on? Well, I was, 
I very much always got my model making head on. So uh, I, I would just try, if I if I had any queries or questions, I would throw them back to Anne or to um, to the guys at the armories and just wait until they came back with with decisions. And slowly it, it morphed into the final display. We I think the final decision was removing the roads and everything like that. So in the end, it was it just became a big, a big field. The when we were looking at these, the deployment, that was a fun day because you all came up to my unit. That's the unit in Leicestershire. And I'd got all these figures. I don't know, they're probably a hundred figures on a, on a block of foam. And we just played toy soldiers for a few hours, yeah. working out. Shoving them around. Out how the, how the story would work, how the English would probably deploy. Because I think at first we had them quite tight quite a tight curve and the English flanks were floating outside of the woods so we pushed those back into the woods to make it more well, so it's, 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 it, yeah more believable yeah one of the and big then, challenges you have is uh, you know with a, a static display you're having to compress an entire battle narrative into one scene and people That's have to right. be able to understand what's going on, the sort of pre and post that scene, just looking at the model. So I understand here that what you've done is you've actually combined a number of different parts of the battle That's into right. this one yeah. scene. Because mm. you've got the cavalry going in on each one on the right flank, they're turning around after being chopped up and then or, or shot up, coming back, bursting through the ranks. And on the left flank, they're still going in with the That's infantry right. up up close to the, the English. What really happened was the cavalry went in, they got, they got um, spurred into charging first and uh, came a cropper, ran back, and then the infantry started moving down. That's me with an ice cream. Because I mean, you were the working worst. closely with uh, Professor Anne Curry, weren't you? Who was uh, right, yeah. one of our trustees at the time, and of course has written yeah. numerous books on Ashingcore. Um, and then there was Dr. Tom Richardson, who is also the deputy master. He was in that photograph work as well. And Dr. Malcolm Mercer, who was the lead curator for this. So you had, I suppose you had to, you had a lot of um, advice you had to take on board, but there was still must yeah, be yeah. some challenge to pick, okay, yeah. exactly which moment are we going to show here? But I think yeah. you've, you've, you've successfully, I think people understand what's going on, you know, quite, quite easily just by looking at uh, the diorama. I, I, I think it was a very easy discussion, really, because I think Anne and the guys came back from very much the historical bit. And then we had the model making and just making an interesting diorama. Because, yeah, the temptation was to perhaps put the English line and the French line in melee. But that would have put all the action into a very small area on a four metre by two metre table. So by spreading it out and and there's there's action happening everywhere so it's a it's a interesting to look at from all sorts of different angles and um that was an easy discussion to have really it was it, i think everybody was very receptive to everybody else's viewpoint on getting a, the best looking <clears throat> situation yeah, it, just, it just felt right it just felt right in the end yeah it did it? With... it did yes yes yeah and I think it does look all right, doesn't it, on that? No, I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did say so ourselves. <laughs> yeah, although we say so ourselves, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. That segues quite nicely into, um, into our next sort of theme, um, where we're kind of looking at historical accuracy, and we've got some of the, the key figures um, from the diorama itself on the screen for you now. Um, just before we get into uh, who exactly these, these chaps are and what they did during the battle, um, Keith, can you just walk us through some of some of the um, important factors that we're needed to be considered when, when looking at a diorama like the Ashley for one reason? Um, well, I mean, you were looking in the case of our diorama, it's, it's based very much on the latest research. And there has been a lot of research in the last few years, um, but of course, more research will, uh, will happen in the future. Um, it's unlike, well, as I said earlier, it's possible that the location of the battlefield might have to be revised because one of the interesting things actually is that um, archeological surveys done 
at the beginning of the 19th century and also in the beginning of the 21st century um, came up with very little. I should say the ones in the 21st century came up with, with nothing, actually, which is surprising. You would expect some things to be found on a battlefield, you know, broken spurs or buckles and things like that. Um, but I mean, yeah, I think we've alluded to the fact that there are a lot of challenges uh, to getting a static model right. And it's one reason I think why a lot of museums have gone over to digital now uh, where you can see a film reconstruction. But nonetheless, um, I think uh, in terms of dioramas, they still offer something to the public. And certainly, you know, when the Royal Armouries was open pre-COVID and hopefully when we open again, the, uh, the model receives uh, a lot of attention. Um, and a lot of work went into the historical accuracy. I mean, my, uh, Michael and Alan, are very keen on historical accuracy. It's something they know a lot about. They've done a lot of research. They're both reenactors. Uh, Michael suffering his famous injury during uh, one reenactment. So I don't think there was a huge amount of input from us regarding the um, the range that you had already produced. Because uh, I mean, it had to. It was approved by us, wasn't it? But you had been working with Toby Capwell, I think. Yeah, when I designed figures, uh, this particular range, I say it was about 10, 12 years. Uh, ago now, um, Tobias Capwell uh, at the time he lent his PhD on uh, his arm uh, on, uh, on arms and armor, on armor actually sorry, and uh, yeah he was very not very kindly uh, so gave the whole thing to me, and uh, so I had great reference for particularly the English armors of the period, uh, but yes I was making sure I get I like we always like to get it right the armor. And having worn armor in reenactments, we know how to how it works and how you move in it, and how weapons are held it's all at the right sort of uh, the right balance and everything else. So, looking at the commanders here, I mean, did you did you set out with an idea of exactly who you wanted to show on the battlefield? I mean, uh, you, you couldn't show everybody, so you'd have had to make no, a decision. It was, it was a decision really made uh, by the armories. They were by the sort of, uh, sorry, yeah, by the armies. Um, but it, it was fairly obvious which ones were going to be the main ones on there. We could have got a lot more in, but the, uh, I think it would confuse uh, the matter if you had too many uh, celebrities <laughs> on the uh, table. But uh, the amount that turned up, was, or the amount that they actually put in, was probably about right to show all the important people. I mean, probably the most famous person there is uh, Sir Thomas Erpingham on the left, yeah. who is traditionally said to have thrown a baton, baton in the air to begin the, uh, the archery right. against the French. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, on the left, you've got the Count of Vendôme, and on the right, uh, Sir John Cornwall. Interestingly, uh, Cornwall actually captured... Uh, Vendum uh, during the Battle of Cornwall is, uh, was quite, uh, he had uh, a lot of military experience and was uh, highly regarded as a, a chivalric figure in that period. Uh -huh. So are these photographs, all the photographs that are blown up around the edge of the diorama? So these particular Yes, if you, if you look at the diorama right. now, there's, uh, you've obviously got the diorama and then around it, you've got pictures of the, the main combatants and a short biography next to them. Yeah. And the, the guy in the middle there is, uh, is really quite interesting. He's the Comte yeah. de Richmond. And uh, as you probably know, he was actually found wounded under a pile of bodies uh, after the battlefield. He was captured and taken to England and he was... Uh, he was actually probably one of the earliest tour guides of the battlefield as well, because when he went back there and he went back in 1436 uh, and showed some companions round and said, you know, this is where we were fighting and the English did this here and I was wounded in this place. He didn't think to write down where it was, though, so we could all know. Yeah. 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 No, unfortunately, he doesn't say anything about the topography. Frustrating. <laughs> He's got a lot to answer for, has that? That's no doubt. Yeah. How about these ones, guys? I think we've got some bigger names coming Ooh, on. I think... <laughs> well, I think that's probably Henry V on the left. Um, <laughs> and then the Duke of Alençon on the, on the right. And uh, I mean, one of the, the reasons for this sort of partly chaotic French advance is that there were so many knights actually wanting to get to Henry. He was, after all, the big focus on the battlefield. You know, 
you know, either to capture or kill him. And, um, you know, few people realise uh, Henry got pretty close. At, well, Alanson got pretty close. He was close enough to uh, cut part of Henry's crown off during the melee. He himself was cut down by Henry's bodyguard. But, I mean, Henry was the kind of commander who had, you know, he had seen action before at uh, Shrewsbury in 1403. He wasn't afraid to get into the thick of the melee alongside his, uh, his men at arms. And if we look at the Henry here as well, he, it, it's as though he was almost based off the, the 1944 Henry from the, uh, the Laurence Olivier film. Is, is there any truth in that, Alan? Um, not really. I picked the, the most typical English armour, the most up-to-date English armour for him. Um, but that is exactly, obviously, what uh, they did for the film as well. I think the, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is just, it does scream 1944 movie, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah. And the Kenneth Branagh movie been out when you've done that? Oh, I wouldn't go on that. Don't, no, all right. Everybody's no. <laughs> <laughs> just covered in mud. <laughs> <laughs> right, fair but enough. Don't even mention it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did. <laughs> Anything to say about these chaps? Yeah, so uh, in the centre there, you've got Marshal Bissico, who was um, probably one of the most famous French knights of the, of the era. Uh, and he was one of the leading figures at at Agincourt, he was captured. Um, and uh, for those of us living in Yorkshire, he actually died in Methley, which is uh, not too far away from uh, the Royal Armoury. So I don't think the, the house is there anymore, but uh, if you want to make a pilgrimage, then, uh, then go to Methley. Um, I think this this slide is... Oh, David, this is for you. It's, it's some painful memories for David, so... <laughs> do, yes, do you want to... We had quite a few discussions generally about the, the layout of the board and things like that, but so, somehow we, we got started talking about coppicing, medieval coppicing. And if you look at the diorama, there are there is coppicing in those woods either side of the um, of the field, and um, it, it it yeah it took us quite quite a few to and fro's to to get to get the coppicing sorted out. I think it wanted I think they wanted a little bit of interesting stuff happening on the peripheral on it on the flanks just to just to break it up a little bit and um and the okay, coppicing was, was what we went with i think that's enough about coppicing there i think so <laughs> that, <laughs> that signals the end of the coppicing segment for this evening. <laughs> and, must um, have been important to have taken a photograph of that so and then yeah now we start getting onto the you can see the the, the cloud fields and um the colouring of the of the landscape and because I think am I right in thinking that some soil from Agincourt was actually brought back for you sort of either used as colour inspiration or yes uh, er, earlier on one of the earlier photographs I noticed we got a when Anne with the picture with Anne in there was a, a a palette of three three or four different colours and all diff, slightly different colour for the di, to decide the the um the colour of the ground so that real soil for Imagine Core did play a part in it. I can't remember actually if it made it onto the diorama or just as a colour reference. Oh, should so, we might, so we might have a piece of Imagine Core in the diorama. You then. may well have. <laughs> you may well have somewhere. Yes. And, but, and yes. just just a word on the on the field itself. I mean you can see yeah, I mean, about it's, it was fouled. The uh, the battle was fought in horrendous conditions really. I mean the, the weather had been terrible leading up to the battle. Um, and, you know, when the French were advancing across the battlefield at Agincourt, they were really getting bogged down in the mud and that was really tiring them out. And you had horses, you had different bodies of men churning up the, uh, the, uh, the terrain, which made it really hard going. Um, I mean, I like what you've done here, David, to sort of suggest the mass movement of, uh, of men across the landscape. And uh, certainly the, it reminds me of um, an earlier event just prior to the Battle of Agincourt at Peron, when uh, the English came across this mass of hoof prints and footprints in the mud ahead of them and sort of uh, gave them this terrible impression of everything that was going to, that uh, potentially what awaited them ahead on the road. Yeah. Well, th I remember this for a different reason because um, that those footprints were done with an in, with a, a cut piece of balsa wood, and I just spent 
I'd, I'd, I'd scrape out uh, some wet plaster onto the landscape and then just tap this balsa wood into the wet plaster for, um, well, you know, an hour at a time until I, I had to go and have a cup of tea and then get back to it. And because there's probably, well, I don't know, three or four square meters of footprints in there. So you can imagine how long that took to, um, <laughs> Oh, to uh, tap out. Oh gosh. <laughs> and but it was it was the uh, it was hard doing the the um uh, the plowed field trying to keep the them in straight lines and mm. that was um that was one of the more challenging bits of it. Anyway, so, yes. Alan, you were sort of um, responsible for formulating the colour palette, I think, uh, to sort of Oh, to sort of reflect um, so the kind of clothing that the, the knights and men at arms would have worn as opposed to uh, some of the ordinary soldiers. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I did a yeah, colour palette for the lower classes, uh, the archers and um, the French um, uh, lower classes as well as the English and the uh, nobles as well. So to get, get at least the, the right hues anyway, as a sort of... So it'd be more subdued for the um, rank and file, and uh, the colours a little bit more fast and uh, bright for the the, the nobles. Uh, all the, the French nobles uh, usually covered their armour, but so, uh, sometimes in jupons or houppelands or tabards. Uh, not always um, with heraldry. Just, sometimes they're just plain or party coloured. Um, as you can see, just there, you can see that they are, they are coloured. But we couldn't ask the painters to do heraldry on loads and loads of figures. <laughs> that would have been just too much for them. So how, the much, how much yeah. help did you have then with the with the painting? Was there quite a big team involved? No. No. <laughs> right. no, no. There were two guys, weren't two. there, mainly, that did yeah. 4,000 of them. Yep. So it worked out they were doing 500 time. a month for eight <clears> months. <throat> wow. Which is, so they did a, a terrific job. And then we had... Three or four other guys doing the sort of the the personalities the and the personalities. yeah. There's a, and actually all those uh, in the foreground that we just saw uh, were done by Andy Taylor. Actually, a lot of those. Um, <clears throat> I did I did some and uh, not many, but I did some. I did a few quite a lot of conversions as well of the original yeah. range, uh, like wounded uh, figures and uh, figures falling off horses. Uh, you might want to name check, check the main main two. People who actually did do the painting, yeah, David. What they yeah, go on. No, oh. I. <laughs> oh, <laughs> remind me. Remind me. No, yes, I I'll can get you to remind me. Yeah, <laughs> can you put it in notes later? <laughs> uh, we've so on from that. Get <laughs> oh. back, back to you <laughs> with Richard <laughs> and somebody. Uh, I, mean, um, I think this slide makes the point, doesn't it? That Contrary to the myth that it's a, a small band of archer brothers fighting this huge French force, you actually had a significant number, you know, maybe about 25% of the English force were men at arms and they were in yes. arms and they played a pretty important role in pushing the French attack back. Oh, yeah. yeah. And as you see, a lot of the English were, uh, they usually like to keep their armour uh, on display as white armour, sort of, sort of shining in the sun, uh, or white. Um, but there are, it was actually, they're supposed to be worn the St. George on the back and uh, chest, but uh, a lot of the time you see them just in, uh, sort of in, without any covering at all, but it was a typically English way as well. Uh, the French and, usually cover their armour. In the heat of a battle like Agincourt, and um, say, you know, everyone's wearing a similar sort of style of armour, and perhaps your your opponent or whoever doesn't have a jupon or, or, or isn't doesn't have their armor covered. How do you distinguish between who who you are fighting and who is your friend? Is it no, you mainly based on who's you tell by the you? style of their moustaches? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, doubt, doubtlessly in any battle, you always get sort of friendly fire, and you end up uh, with two sides, uh, well, two groups of men fighting each other who are actually on the same side. Um, but 
you, you would have had uh, standard bearers next to yeah. certain individuals yeah. who would have kept close to the commanding officer because they yeah. served as a rallying point. So it was quite important that you were recognised on the battlefield. And like Alan said, there would have been field signs like the Red Cross of St. George. And then the, some of the French, as you can see here, were wearing white crosses as well. Mm. Mm. And if we look at this photo here, it's, probably, it's one of the best photos that we can see the actual arrows um, pointing out of the ground. How was it that you guys went about installing the arrows was, and what was the sort of journey it, through that? Down to Dave, uh, Dave Andrews, yeah. Yeah. who works at the Games Workshop, who came along. And I think you'd already started putting some in, David, some in. We in had, yes, I tried very thin brass rod and it was just too thick mm. and too long. Yeah. Uh, he said, how Am I just painting some bristles, tops of the bristles with white, and just cut, cut the bristles off from a, a broom and just stick them in? And I thought, oh, yeah, that might work. So, so I remember I went <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the local market hunting down a brush <laughs> with brown bristles so, and then chopping them all to size, and the three of us took a morning. Just, oh, a bit longer than that, I think. <laughs> was it? I, I, I think so, yeah. I think, Just, we, we got, I think we did around about a thousand before we got f really fed up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Doing it. And you could only you could only see them in these lovely pictures yeah. with the light at the right angle. When we finished with that yellowy back. light, couldn't, couldn't, under see him. It, couldn't see them. It was, um, <laughs> but it was worth it. It does look. Yeah. There's enough on there to. Um, I mean, the the English longbowman has sort of. Uh, a bit of a myth around him, doesn't he? This sort of this invincible, um, lowly uh, archer defeating all these French uh, armoured men at arms. But it's a bit more complicated than that. And I suppose, you know, one of the great um, stories from the, the Battle of Agincourt is uh, the, the sun being blotted out by the number of arrows that were raining down on the French. But actually, um, if the if the English archers were keeping up that rate of um, arrow fire all the time. They've been out of arrows within, I think, something like two minutes. Some people have, uh, some people have estimated. So that that's sort of a bit of a myth of the battle. I mean, obviously they played a, a crucial role, but uh, yeah, just sort of raining down constantly, thousands and thousands of arrows all the time. I don't think really happened. I mean, they might have done it occasionally, but most of the shots that they yeah. they took would have been more um, carefully aimed. Well placed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And what, what kind of um, discussions did you have surrounding the placement of the stakes? Because there are numerous interpretations, you know, were, was it a fence in front or were the archers interspersed amongst the stakes? We mixed it up a bit. So oh, that's how you got around. <laughs> in the front, as, as a lot of sources, well, contemporary, not contemporary, but um, more modern sources say, but they're also in between the archers, which is, I think there's a reference to it early on that some of the, you can, you can see there's uh, stakes in amongst them as well. Uh, so it's, it's not just stakes at the front, it would have probably have been all through the ranks. Which would think, have been yeah, on, on the model we've done both. <laughs> yeah. both. Yeah. I think there was some, um, I mean, I certainly get a lot of questions about the flags on the diorama and you probably do too, but they're not sort of fluttering in the wind and I think um, Dr. Tom Richardson did a lot of research into the uh, the painter, actually, who was responsible for a lot of these flags, and uh, they were actually flown, well, they weren't flying, they were held stiff, weren't they, by Buckram, I think? That's right, yeah. Yes, uh, oh, the Buckram, Hamish, with, with Buckram, with uh, a silk on the outside, with, or did have a, might, they might have had a baton along the edge, top edge, just to hold them stiff. Yeah. My wife uh, is a, a costumer, but uh, for, for years, historical costumer, and uh, she just she ever heard a conversation about that uh, buckram being used for the uh, insides of uh, sandwiching a banner, and he said buckram of the period was really expensive, it probably, and it wasn't stiff at really? that period. So it's probably something else. You, I mean, they had other stiffness, so it might not be buckram. <laughs> That's interesting. So again, it's um, research is developing all the time. We're finding out new things <clears throat> every year, really, aren't we? Yeah. Sorry about that. Just yeah. yeah. <laughs> you ruined you ruined the uh, story. Then. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs>
And, and just a quick note on these carts. Um, I, I, yeah. I've always, whenever I've looked at the diorama, I've always just thought they were that, just carts, but I've been mistaken. Um, no, there's the two, two very small cannon on those carts, on sledges. You can't really see them from this angle, but um, they were brought up, uh, but they weren't used. They're um, in the rear. They never got, they never even put in the ground, I would think. They were never used, though, yeah. But I think probably we, I mean, we put them on because of it. Well, just the discussion point, didn't we? Oh, yeah, no, it's good. Um, yeah. Um, and um, yeah. And there's uh, another, yeah, there's yeah. another nice nuance in, in this picture as well. Um, what, what's yeah. Going on? The, there's a couple of, you can see a few archers falling back in front of the French, but they're, these were in place in front of the men at arms. And uh, we had a bit of a discussion with, um, with Anna Curry and uh, other armourers people. And came down to the idea that they would have archers in front and they would just fall back in front of the, the main um, English men at arms just before the French probably hit. It's all supposition, but um, possibly and it seems logical to do that. Yes. And we're kind of into the, the assembly and then the, the install in the Tower of London here. So if I just roll through the slideshow, are you guys okay just to give a little bit of a commentary about? Um, the, the process and, and your emotions seeing seeing this all come together. It, well, one of the the things that we had to consider with with this was that getting it into the top of the tower, uh, it had to be small enough to get through the windows and through the archways. So uh, it, the board, the, the final diorama is four meters by two meters, but each piece is made of four pieces of one meter by two meters to get into the top windows of the tower, as you can see. And um, so, that was a rainy day, day wasn't it, guys? It, was, it, yeah. it was It was raining all day, and then when it was our turn, it stopped raining to get the bits into the into the top of the tower. It was, that was, it was a very nervous time, that seeing it winched up and into the, into the tower. And that's us sitting at the tower waiting our turn to put it in very keen on health and safety and all that. So, so did, you, did you have to replant the figures when, or some of the figures when you were at the tower then? Uh, a few. I think there were a few, not many. No, we, no um, not many, no. The, the, the thing we had to do was uh, fill in the, the, the joins and so extend the cloud fields across the, across the joins. Fill the um, gaps, yeah. And little, so, that, and that, we, we had green flock as well to, to help with, with that. And then um, that was the opening night, wasn't it? At the time. Mm, great yeah. night. That was uh, pretty surreal. <laughs> that was a good night. It was, it was, very, it was yeah, just, I mean, we, you know, we make toy soldiers and we're there in, you know, the top. Oh, it was, yes. Yes, very weird. And then that's and the three of, of us. That was on test day, wasn't it, before? And yes, then, it was. Presto, yeah. Oh yes, this is a this is now a, a, a stop go of installing it into Leeds. So uh, after it had been at the tower for three months or so, it came up to it, it, it's been into Leeds. So I I came and installed it, and this was all done before I turned up. So that's the space, and then. Any second now, six big boxes are going to, four big boxes are going to appear. There are those four boxes in the left. So that's the diorama. And then um, it's my turn soon to start opening those up and getting the boards out, ready to come into the, into the big framework there. There you go. There I am. In... Because uh, you weren't involved in this bit, were you, Michael and Alan? No, I think we were in New Zealand. <laughs> Oh, was that yeah. working on the Gallipoli diorama? It, it, yeah. it was either going to be Leeds or New Zealand, and we thought New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> you can see as well that the border, you've got these little little rectangles. These are periscopes. So you can get a bird's eye, uh, not a bird's eye view, the opposite to a bird's eye view of the diorama. Uh, yeah. An eye, uh, an eye level view of the diorama by looking into the into them and so you get there's six of them six periscope views yeah 
There's Henry V, yeah. the guns, some foragers. Um, foragers. Oh. Yep. Oh, there you oh, go. Oh, no. Big Yes, and I remember the, 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 the finishing thought about, about the installing it at Leeds was when the, the glass went onto the top and it was sealed. And that was that was it. There was no there was no way I was ever going to be able to look at it and think, oh, that figure needs to be twisted, or that was it. It was done, and it was quite an emotional, quite an emotional point that I remember. I was sitting on I was having, sitting on the floor. There's there, you've got that island of siege equipment, haven't you, just next to it? Yes. Yeah. Is it all? Yeah. And I remember sitting on that wall, and it was and that was it. And the guys just. Yeah, it was very strange, but, but satisfying at the same time. Yeah. Yes, funny Ma what you remember, eh? <laughs> uh, Ma Michael and Alan, have, have you guys been back to see um, the diorama since? And what, what are your sort of overarching emotions of, of the project as a whole? Yes. Back on it? We have, yeah, yeah. Actually, we've been up there once or twice, maybe twice. Since, uh, since it's been installed, since. yeah. <clears throat> um, well, I. I'm amazed by is that it was actually um, it was uh, so close to the cyber diorama, which has been there for well, I mean, <laughs> which is 170 years old. Existed, yeah. well, so it's well, absolutely yeah. stunning, just incredible that our diorama we did yeah. is amongst such uh, amazing uh, heritage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'm very proud of it. Keith, you you work with oh, yes. um, you work with the, the in the museum every day, and you see the diorama and see how people kind of interact with it. What, what do you think um, this says about dioramas and museums? Um, well, I think them? I mean, firstly, you know, we, it was commissioned in 2015, and we decided to commission a essentially static diorama rather than invest a lot of money into into something more digital. So although a lot of museums are going down the digital route. Um, you only have to spend 10 minutes in the gallery to see how popular that diorama is. It's always surrounded by people, you know. Kids love looking through the periscopes, um, talking to their parents, spotting different characters, you know, Henry V and the carts with the guns. So, you know, model making um, like this has been going on for a few hundred years. I mean, you've talked about Cyborn and I think, it'll probably go on to, and you know, models will continue to be made for many years to come. And, you know, before this talk, we were saying that on the continent particularly, um, you know, dioramas are, are popular. So I do think they, uh, they offer um, the visitor something that, uh, that digital doesn't. Yeah, they're very inspirational, I think, especially for young visitors. Yeah, I, I think they can connect in various ways because you've got, you've got the toy soldier that, for the kids and for the, you know, the the kids in us all. So there's that that appeal. Mm -hmm. There's a it's a very dynamic piece of 3D storytelling. That with a digital piece, you look at a screen and that and you look at what you're given. With this diorama, you can look at wherever you want to look at it, and you can be interested in what you want to be interested in. And I find I, I've, I've stood there by it, like you, Keith, and just looked at people's reaction. And it's, they, it's, it connects to people in so many different ways. And I don't care how it connects to them, whether it's, oh, that's a nice painted tree. I don't care. If it connects, if it connects people, then that's the thing. And that's done its job. I, what I, I remember... Um, Early on, when the diorama was first done, it was at the unit. My daughter-in-law came down to have a look at it. And she has no interest in military history. But she, she looked at it, and then she went to... She, and she had a look around and was interested in it. But then she went off to her parents to have a, have a meal. And she found herself talking about it to her, to her dad. Mm -hmm. And it, it just... That works then, doesn't it? That that does its job. It just makes people interested. However, whether it's for five minutes, ten minutes, or it makes you want to become a 
I don't know, a historic, whatever, I don't know. It just connects people. And, and it serves a, a really um, interesting visual stimulus to, to learn about his, the history, and in that case, the Battle of Agincourt, because Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. some of us really enjoy burying our noses in books, but that's not for everybody. And for some people, uh, seeing something like the, the battle will actually do far more for them than, you know, being shown a book or a, a text yeah. panel in a, in a gallery. I mean, it's just, a, you know, if you talk about the numbers, you know, you say, well, the, the, the French outnumbered the Brit the English. But if you read that in a book, it's hard to potentially visualise, but put it there in front of you, you can see, well, you know, the, the effect that the numbers have or the balance of numbers, or you, it's just a very easy visual tool to use. Um, sorry, I could go on for a long time. With it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, I, I think, think every, brings... every museum should have one, but yeah, I might be biased. <laughs> <laughs> I think that brings this, this segment of the chat to a, a really nice conclusion um, and that we all agree that dioramas are great and there's definitely a, a relevance to them still today. And, and I think just by the, the amount of people at, attending this webinar has kind of proven the fact that they are still very relevant and, still make history very accessible. Um, what we have now is we've got a few minutes um, before we wrap up just for any questions. So we've already had some questions um, coming in, but please do um, throw those in the chat now. If you're on YouTube, put them in the comments um, and we will try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, we've got one here from an uh, anonymous attendee and he's talking about um, how um, arrows were suspended. Now, I don't think this is about our diorama, but it may well have been um, Alan, who have we just lost? Oh. I might have to ask. I might have to ask you then, Michael, um, because I think uh, perhaps one of your oh. ranges at the start had suspended out. Oh, in the, in the shots, yeah, that was um, the use of Photoshop. That's how they <laughs> became suspended. Okay, um, so is there yeah. any way of suspending? Very, very straightforward. Arrows or not? <laughs> Probably not. No arrows. No, there, no, no. It was it was a big enough job just sticking arrows in the ground. <laughs> so yeah, to, try and get suspended midair. That would have been interesting, wouldn't it? You you have a you have a sort of shower of arrows over the diorama, don't you? Yes, we do. Yeah, that was one of yeah. the sort of big art things for the exhibition, which we brought up to Leeds as well. Mm, that was very effective. A good question for you, Hickey. Um, has there been any progress on finding the actual castle for the um, the chateau of Agincourt? Um. I don't know, actually. It's not something I've really looked into, so sorry, I can't really answer that. We did, we did ask about that. We did ask, I think it was Anne about that, actually. I'm mm. sure there has, there has been basically the, the, the ground plan of a manor house, a square um, kind of um, fortified manor house, just about the minimum level, very uh, just below the surface. Uh, I, I think it is still there somewhere. Um, to the left of the battlefield here. Yeah. And when you're when you're painting something on on this kind of scale, it, it, is there a kind of prioritizing? Like do you do you kind of look more to um, the knights, or the, uh, do you kind of put more effort into key characters, that kind of thing? How, how do you do it on such a big scale? Well, with well, with this one, it was um, everything was painted to a, a standard for because we had. To get through so many but then the certain characters and the guys particularly in the periscopes that were going to be close be looked at closely and any potentially any figures that were on the back ranks that were going to be closest to the public yeah then they then we made an effort with those more that was using the um the other painters and i, mean, I painted a few cavalry and that sort of thing just uh, um so that was, it, yeah. so it wasn't, it wasn't that they were the knights particularly, it was what was going to be closely, going to be viewed more closely. I think there's a couple I of... It. Is that right? Would you agree yeah. with that, Michael? Yeah, I think it's a couple of periscopes near the back of the French army. Uh, um, all, all there is at the back of the French army are, are the, the lowest of the low in terms of uh, military types. <clears throat> um, but all those were painted uh, with a bit more um, yeah. time. And I think and so, it's the um, there's a small group of English archers, aren't there? Next uh, on the flank of the French. Yes, yeah, they were. Is there, a is there a periscope on those? Because I think there they is, were painted. Yeah, yeah. I think they were painted uh, better than yeah, the, rest anything, of the archers. Yeah, anything up close. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. So, 
Welcome back, Alan. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll, throw a, we'll throw a question your way. Um, someone's asked, uh, Jose, in fact, has asked, uh, what was the scale? Um, and are all the minis for the diorama cast in metal? Um, or were the uh, Perry plastic kits already around at the time of building it? Uh, they're nearly all metal. I, I think the, I had the first frame of the plastic English back uh, just before the end of it. I managed to just get a few of those on there. Uh, but it was nearly all 99.9% metal. Apart from all the resin. Oh, and the resin blocks. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. 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 So are all, are all those figures uh, available to buy from Perry Miniatures or did you sculpt some particularly for the diorama? No, uh, we, what I did, um, um, again, 90, probably 98% of the ones are actually miniatures from the range. I made, but I did quite a few conversions, which were only for the diorama, like the falling horseman and the um, uh, wounded horses and uh, wounded figures. Uh, some of the wounded figures, but and a few individual figures I did, um, like the archers running back and the um, vintner or sergeant sort of stopping them and getting them around the back. Um, a few bit odds and sods, I um, alternated. <laughs> Although we don't actually sell the resin blocks. No, we, we don't, don't do that. Because they were made for the diorama and we can't sell those. We had lots of people asking. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got another question in here uh, asking what type of paint you guys use for the diorama well, and. What what sort of paint did you use for the diorama? Hmm. It's going to be <laughs> acrylic paint. Um, uh, I don't know what they used, but it would have been acrylic. I, I think um, they used games, games Workshop paints and um, presumably and uh, all of the uh, Malaysia, the Malaysia 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 stuff. Malaysia. Yeah. Malaysia. So, so but paint, wolf paint, yeah, wolf paint, yeah, acrylic yeah, paint. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this is one for uh, Alan and Michael. When you do your illustrations, what um, what medium and again, what, what sort of paint do you use for those? <laughs> I use exactly the same, same one. Actually, yeah, model, model paints. Yeah, for a, a workshop ones or uh, a layer. Um, yeah. <laughs> same paints. <laughs> I used yeah. to use those until about a year ago and then I started going to Gouache, which is a lot easier and quicker. <laughs> uh, for the painting, for illustrating. Um, we've got another one here that which we, we, we've sort of um, already answered, but in, in terms of the battle, it says, does it depict one moment or several parts? Um, can, can you just go into a little bit about that, about the, the, the different elements of the battle um, that are depicted? Yeah, Where so you, you had, um, sorry, you were saying, Michael, I was, it was, uh, I was just going to say several parts because we had to uh, make it look lively <laughs> and sh to tell the story. So we needed to have the, definitely needed the cavalry charging. Uh, which happened wanted the map. first, didn't it? Mm, which, which would, yeah, exactly. That would have happened first. And then they retired, fell back, and the infantry started moving off. And uh, so we've kind of constantined it a bit for a dramatic effect. But um, uh, hopefully, it adds to it rather than distracts from it. Did we have a discussion about the three ranks of the French? Was it? Were we at one stage doing two? Um, no, there's a number. Is it always going to be three? A load of horsemen, which were <laughs> are mentioned by some chroniclers, isn't there? But yeah. uh, I think that went out the window. And did they? <laughs> uh, is the third rank full of bowmen? Uh, yeah. The the, yeah, the, 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 the French didn't use them, did they? No, no, not no, really. which is um, they, did, they had them, but they didn't. There was not any big um, masses or anything. No, no. Well, the I think in the battle, most of the knights and men at arms were so keen to get into action, yeah. particularly to get at Henry, that it was just sort of forget about the bowmen and uh, let's let's charge essentially. Yeah, and, and all the French French nobles and leaders in that first. Arrow point. Yes. Was, is that true? That I, I seem to remember that we put a lot of the characters there, but, and then when yeah. they that failed, then they'd lost their sort of lost their head. They lost their <laughs> the leadership. It does sound like there was a lot of vying to be at 
in there first against mm. the English king. So uh, all the nobility would want to be in the front or in the front ranks or in the, foot, the front um, battle. Which uh, partly explains why the cavalry attacks didn't really work because there were so f relatively few uh, men at arms who wanted to take part in that cavalry charge. They all wanted to be in the vanguard of the, uh, yeah. the infantry attack. Yeah. Mm. So I think that our front rank has got that arrowhead, hasn't it? Uh, uh, so they're, they're being squeezed by the bowmen and then they're all trying to get to Henry. So that's sort of natural mm. progression funneling yeah. into the middle. Just yeah. um, really didn't help them, I don't think. No, no. So, <laughs> 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 understatement. The result. <laughs> They're under a bit of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> We've had a nice, a nice question in from Robert Oldham, um, and yeah, I, I don't know if you, if you're able to answer this, but they've asked how many hours, um, how many person hours went into its creation. Is there Ooh. an estimate we can give? I imagine it was a few. A lot. I don't know. I, I'm. I usually would do record my hours on work, but I didn't with this. But it, it, we had quite a long time, about 18 months, was it? Yeah. I think it was we, right. um, <laughs> So we had, there were bursts of high activity and then periods where we were waiting for information back or, so it, it was a really up and down sort of workload. Yeah, but the, um, and then the then the painters or the figures. The, the um, painters really probably worked the hardest. Yeah. Over the, a longer the longest period of time, it's five hundred yeah. a month for eight mm. months. It's a, that's a lot of work. And you can't remember their names. Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was Andy. <laughs> Andy and Rich, Rich, Richard was it? Andy and Richard was it? Oh, I do apologise. I do. Watching it. Well, Andy, now, Andy and Richard aren't watching. Yeah, <laughs> they will be. I know Apologies to Andy and Richard. They might be. If you are. If you are watching. Um, we've got time just for one final question. Um, oh, I've got an it's... email from them. No, I haven't. No. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's from uh, Andrew Knight to, to everybody. Um, what are you working on at the moment? What, what's the next big thing you will have coming up? Oh, I can show you. Oh, oh, should I show? What? Well, I'm working on that kind of thing, but smaller, Franco Prussian. That's plastic. Uh, there's a three up plastic. Yeah, uh, that's a three up um, for a plastic set of Franco Prussians, oh, Prussians for the Franco Prussian War. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing uh, similar sorts of thing. I'm working on about uh, three or four different <laughs> arrangements, but uh, one of the main thing, one of the big ones is a um, uh, Prussian, Russian. Sort of uh, cavalry box, uh, plastic cavalry box uh, for dragoons and such. And uh, that I'm working on that to get it ready for tooling, hopefully fairly soon. For Napoleonic. Uh, for sorry, for Napoleonic period. Yeah. And I've got more um, bespoke stuff. I'm I'm actually working on a, a Franco-Prussian church, which. Um, oh yes, good. In, for me. in one thirty, in one thirty, oh. which looks lovely. Oh, that's just over <laughs> my shoulder here. I'm I'm working on some. Um, Actually, a non-war gaming or historical piece. It's for static caravans for their next advertising campaign. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, that's fascinating. It's it's that is it uh, anyway? I uh, yes, it is. <laughs> Honestly, it is. Uh, Michael, they're probably watching this. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they're um, yeah. I, I, Unlikely. So that, but the, the, the interesting bit with that is I did it last or well, not last year, the year before. It's the the photo shoots with it. Because I've never had a, a pop art director and you know creative director and everything doing a photo shoot, and it was really really fascinating getting getting a different approach and a different eye to to photographing my normally military and historically based stuff to a more advertising and just a, a different view on it. It was. I loved it. It was brilliant. Was there any cop was there any coppicing? Involved? There was no coppicing. The, the hard bit is I, I love to weather my, my buildings so make it look like they've been through a bit of history. And of course their their vans, they needed them pristine. So I was painting these vans and wanting to put just a little bit of a water streak or a 
you know, a bit of moss or something like that. And no, nothing. It, uh, there had to be <laughs> brand new. So that was that was a challenge. But um, yes. So I'm, that's what I'm, I'm working on at the minute. I'm very conscious that we're, we are slightly over, um, but the questions are still running in. Is everyone happy to stay for another five minutes? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I <laughs> Um, we've got a nice one coming from Andy Neal, and he's, he's asked, <laughs> was anyone... Uh, <laughs> I, I know Andy, it. Andy. Um, <laughs> was anyone wary of, of adding too much blood, or what was the, the process of adding blood to the dialogue? Well, oh, I mean, well, actually, there, there was a point, there was a point where one meeting we went to where they didn't want bodies. Yes. And yeah, yeah. We, oh, we, we, we actually said, it's a battle. We've got to have bodies yeah. or something. Everybody knows. <laughs> and uh, they came by the next meeting, it was reversed. And oh, we'll get, yeah, we'll put bodies in as well. That's all right. But at one point, for a brief while, well, there was going to be no yeah, bodies. Yeah, I forgot about oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there was no blood. I don't think we've got blood on. I don't think there's any. It's a. Oh, I don't know. It is. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, blood is. goes brown anyway, doesn't it, when it dries? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it peaks out a bit. <laughs> Um, and then we, we've had another one come in from Scatter Dice, um, and they've asked, what wargaming rule sets do you prefer, um, prefer the most for medieval gaming? Well, uh, we well, normally use um, Hail Caesar, don't we? The tweets. Yeah, it, a modified version of Hail Caesar that Rick's changed, yeah. But only slightly stats and things, yeah. <clears throat> Yes, I've only uh, played yeah, one medieval used... game, and that was with you guys. So, oh I'll yeah, well, that's what you used. <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> and then, just finally, one from Jeff, who's asked, "Who designed the cabinet um, and made the decision to include the periscopes because it sets off the model cabinet?" Well, <clears throat> originally we we wanted it a bit higher, didn't we? Displayed higher so that you could get those. Uh, Views, view. eye level views, but of course you can't have it that high because then that would limit who could look at it. So then, it, so then the periscopes came in from that, didn't they? When we, when yeah, we, we wanted the eye level view because they're, they're really dramatic. Mm. And it, that was the guys who were doing the shot fitting. They 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 fitted the whole exhibition. And again, completely slipped my mind who they the company's called. <laughs> can you can you remember? No. 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 No, it's all on you. No, it's yours. No. You're project manager. <laughs> we'll add them to the list of apologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, after this webinar. I'm, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so that was, that was their, their decision and the, 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 the cabinet as well. And the um, I remember the glass is really thick, so, so people can potentially yeah, climb on it. Dance on it. Yeah, which, yeah, so <laughs> I remember it was really, really heavy. I noticed that at Leeds when you're being there. I, I don't know if I picked it up while I or lifted an end up, but it was incredibly heavy glass. So, uh, yeah. And just, I, just should, I should do some up. homework before I do these things and get some names down. Right? <laughs> just, just finally, uh, a question from me. Um, there was an unlimited budget and a museum approached you guys and said make us a diorama what what would be this the sort of dream diorama um, what's the one Ooh. that you would love to make Ooh. well i would like to make one with lots of buildings <laughs> <clears throat> and preferably not uh, older buildings so you know not the, all these new metal -y type square buildings but characterful i i love making buildings that's my so anything with buildings. <laughs> we'll give you Stalingrad then, David. Stalingrad will be great. <laughs> At the moment, the Battle of Gravelot during the Franco-Russian yes. War. Um, but t six months ago, it would have been something else. <laughs> yes. It, it, whatever anybody approaches me with, really, I, I get enthused by their enthusiasm. So it just gets, just, um, yeah, snowballs out of control. So <laughs> I think um, any with a lot of figures on already, <laughs> for me. <laughs> so, we need, so, so we need and we need a, a diorama lots of buildings with, lots of figures with, lots of buildings lots of figures so what about the, <clears> the first day of gettysburg when they did they go through gettysburg didn't they oh they only marched through it oh there was a yeah. bit of, a yeah, yeah that would that would work wouldn't it potentially or 
You want, dull. You want brighter colours. Brighter colours. Yeah. You don't want green, just grey and blue, do you? And Keith, we, we clean out the Royal Armoury storeroom. What's the next guy? <laughs> going in? Oh, um, oh, I think if I could, I'd really like to see the Battle of Bosworth done in 28 millimeter. Yeah, that'd be good. There's no yeah. buildings yeah. in that though. Come on, <laughs> no, you put a few tents in. <laughs> well, I think that brings us nicely to the end of the webinar. So that just leaves me to say a massive thank you to all of our participants. Um, it's been a really uh, engaging chat with you all. Uh, and a special thank you to Keith for um, bringing everybody together um, and for organizing this. And a huge thank you to um, every one of you for, uh, for tuning in and for, for sticking with us and for watching. Um, as I said at the start, the Royal Army is, is um, a charity. And like all charities, we have been hit by COVID. So if you do feel compelled and you did enjoy today, please do think about donating to the museum. You can do that on the links uh, in the chat and on YouTube. Um, or consider becoming a member as well, which gives you exclusive access to lots of different benefits um, and things like that. So other than that, have a wonderful evening or whatever time of day it is where you're dialing in from. And thank you very much for tuning in. See you next time. Thank you. All right. More. Bye. Bye.